بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والله أخرجكم من بطون أمهاتكم لا تعلمون شيئا وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة لعلكم تشكرون صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters The beginning point of every human is total ignorance in the verse I recited before you, Allah says, Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum And Allah removed you from the womb of your mother. La ta'lamuna shay'a You knew absolutely nothing. Not only were we born ignorant, but even the faculties for the acquisition of knowledge were not developed. So at the point of birth, the faculties have not evolved, they have not matured. The different milestones that a child evolves وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَ Then he develops the hearing ability, the seeing, the grasping, so on and so forth. And then in another verse Allah reminds us that your beginning was total ignorance and then you acquire knowledge and I can deny you all your skill and all your competence and all your information before death. So Allah says, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ ثُمَّ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ It is Allah who created you and it is ultimately He who will cause your death. وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ أَرْضَ لِلْعُمُرِ And there are some that are returned to the wicked age, to the unpleasant age, where a person becomes senile, he loses his faculties, he loses his abilities, he has Alzheimer's, he has dementia, he has loss of memory, he has so many challenges. And the categoric verbatim translation, Allah says, لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ بَعْدَ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا So that he knows nothing after having acquired much of this world. So he's beginning his ignorance. Allah reminds us whatever he learns and whatever man acquires is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah reserves the absolute power, might, and authority to snatch that information away from you. And Allah concludes the verse by saying, Inna Allah alimun qadir. Allah has total knowledge and total power. The scholars of Tafsir tell us that wherever the attributes of Allah appear in the Quran, the translation is the same, but the connotations are different. So alim means the all-knowing. Qadir means the Almighty, the All-Powerful. But the connotations in the context of this ayah is, Alim, I have knowledge, hence I know when to snatch the knowledge and from who. Qadir, my power is so complete, I can even snatch the knowledge from a young man in his youth and I can preserve the faculties of an old man despite his old age. That's the knowledge, that's the power of Allah. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said, Ta'allam falaysa al-mar'u yuladu alima. Develop within you the ability to learn because no man was born learned. Walaysa akhu ilmin kaman huwa jahilu. And if there's something you can never equate is the learned and the uneducated. وَإِنَّ كَبِيرَ الْقَوْمِ لَا عِلْمَ عِنْدَهُ صَغِيرٌ إِذَا الْتَفَّتْ عَلَيْهِ الْجَحَافِلُ And if someone is senior by age, senior by age, but when the time comes for crunch, his absence of knowledge will expose him that despite his seniority of age, he's actually a junior. He might be longer in this world, he might have age on his side, but if he lacks, he's devoid, he's bereft of knowledge, then he is sagheer. وَإِنَّ سَغِيرَ الْقَوْمِ إِنْ كَانَ عَالِمَ كَبِيرٌ إِذَا الْتَفَّتْ إِلَيْهِ الْمَحَافِلِ And if a person is tender in age, but he has knowledge, 
then at the time of crunch you will realize that he has knowledge one great scholar said if a person speaks then in his first utterance i will size him up whether he is learned or is ignorant and if he is silent it will take me a week to calculate if he is educated or ignorant but when a person speaks immediately you will know the level of knowledge depth experience and exposure that he has so i want to share with you two things the first that we are in the journey of learning from birth to death we need to be learning all the time we continue learning and when we look at the lives of our pious predecessors may allah be pleased with them they had the eye of learning to the extent that they learn from one and all from juniors they learn from humans they learn from creatures imam suyuti rahmatullah alayhi has written and i read this recently and it made my hair stand on ends he said khamsu khisalin fi sighar law kanat fi al kibar ma'a rabbihim lakanu awliya there are five qualities i've observed in kids imam suyuti says if the adults can adopt this they will be the saints of the time there are five attributes in kids in children khamsu khisalin fi sighar law kanat fi al kibar ma'a rabbihim lakanu awliya if they were to display and imbibe and internalize these attributes with their creator they would be the saint of the time the first one is you would find children la yahtamuna bir rizq they are never concerned or disturbed or anxious about sustenance and income when did you see a child in panic what will i eat where will i eat what are we going to do when did you ever see this being the worry or a uh, bringing a frown on the forelock of a child he's as free as ever he's as natural as ever in the 12 juz allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ma min dabbatin fil ardi illa ala allahi rizquha there isn't a creature but that allah has taken the responsibility to sustain it thereafter allah says wa ya'lamu mustaqarraha wa mustawda'aha and allah is aware of the temporary abode and the permanent location of the soul now the scholars of tafsir the translation is one and same mustaqar and mustawda mustawda in in common arabic they even use it like a warehouse a place where you store things mustaqar a place where you based so the translation is one but the commentary what is meant by a firm place or an established place and a transitory abode they differ the scholars of tafsir have multiple explorations but in tafsir al-kashaf allama zamakhshari has made an amazing correlation between the two allah says he is in charge and he will provide every soul with his sustenance and thereafter allah says he knows where you based temporarily and he also knows where you are based permanently meaning when you at home allah will deliver your sustenance to your house and when you travel in Allah will convey your sustenance to the location where you travel in for the duration. When somebody delivers milk or he does a weekly or you go to phone him, "Hey, don't come this week. We out. We on a break. We gone." Oh, I didn't know I came there. You on there. I left it with the neighbor. Allah says, "I'm responsible and I'm aware. I am cognizant of your location for the duration." So, what is the first thing we learn from children? La yahtamuna bir rizq. they live a free life they live a natural life they don't concern themselves there are so many couplets in arabic that speak about this here wa rizquka laysa yanqusuhu at-ta'anni wa la yazidu fi rizqika al-ana'u the truth be told whether you exert yourself or you somewhat lax you don't increase your revenue or you don't drop your income this is done and dusted and yet the arabic poet said wa min ad-dalil ala al-qada' wa hukmihi look at how the takhayyul was 
ومن الدليل على القضاء وحكمه بؤس اللبيب وطيب عيش الأحمق Amongst the many open testimony to decree and destiny that Allah decrees and Allah has ordained and everything has been written. We believe it's an integral article of our faith and there are a thousand things that prove this year. But amongst the many things that prove, prove to us that there is something like Allah has decreed, you would find many competent, skilled, intellectual individuals grappling to find employment. And you will find many simple, ordinary, naive, nay foolish, uneducated, illiterate, unlettered individuals who own empires. وَمِنَ الدَّلِيلِ عَلَى الْقَضَاءِ وَحُكْمِهِ بُؤْسُ الْلَّبِيبِ Intelligent man, and he's, he doesn't have an income. وَطِيبُ عِيشِ الْأَحْمَقِ And a man who was a dropout in school and juvenile delinquency and he was a black sheep of the family and he never made it today, he's generating the most amount of income. We're not advocating that you mustn't be productive and you mustn't be skilled. What we are saying is that learn from the child that he is very free and relaxed when it comes to sustenance. And yet another poet said, فَلَوْ أَنَّ الْعُقُولَ تَسُوقُ رِزْقًا لَكَانَ كُلُّ لَبِيبٍ مِثْلَ قَارُونِ That if sheer intellect generated revenue, then every intelligent man would have amassed an empire like Qarun. But the truth is otherwise. So the first lesson we learn from a child is, لَا يَهْتَمُّونَ بِالرِّزْقِ if we can only learn this much, if we cannot reach the level of a child, but that this much we can develop, that we don't disobey Allah for the sake of our sustenance, that itself is something. The other day I was giving a talk and I mentioned the Prophet Wasallam's amazing salient feature amongst others was that when victory fell in his lap, he was the most distant human from pride and arrogance. Today we proud and arrogant even in failure. We losing. You down and out. You you know you you lost the game. It's clear. Everybody with half an eye knows. You know what? You've lost it. And yet you're still proud. You're still haughty. You're still arrogant. Arrogant. You're still obstinate. You still have an air about yourself. The Prophet وسلم, was the most humble human. When he was victorious, there was no arrogance. So obviously. That is a sign that there was never arrogance in the life of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the first thing. May Allah bless us with it. The second thing, When children become sick, you never hear them complaining or groaning against Allah. You never heard a child, but why is Allah doing this to me? Why am I being tested? What's, what's this all about? When a child is sick, he cries in his natural, innocent way. Pain, it agonizes him. But you never hear a moan or a groan or an empty statement or something that would conflict with his faith. I often say, it's perfectly fine to complain to Allah, but never to complain about Allah. You must complain to Allah. If you don't complain to Allah, then who do you go? But you don't ever complain about Allah. Just the other day I was flying and I was reading through the, the, the writings of Qadi Shuraih. He was one of the great judge of his time. And even during the time of Sahaba, he was appointed. And he had an amazing eye when it came to the execution of justice. So somebody says, Sami'ani Shuraihun wa ana ashtaki ma ghammani li sadiqin. That I had some issues in my life. So I was complaining to one of my friends. Yeah, things are tough. The goings are hard. These are glitches, snags, challenges, hurdles, impediments, obstacles. And you know, I was really offloading. So Qadi Shuraih overheard what I was saying. So he overheard what I was saying. So he called me and he said, Iyaka wa shikwa li ghayri Allahi Azza wa Jal. Iyaka wa shikwa li ghayri Allahi Azza wa Jal. Oh my brother, let me give you one advice. Don't ever complain to anyone about your issues other than Allah. Fa inna man tashku, 
لا يخلو أن يكون صديقا أو عدوا because whoever you complain to is either a friend or a foe is either an ally or an enemy فأما الصديق فتحزنه وأما العدو فيشمت بك if it is your friend then you're going to sadden him because he's going to be hurt and it's going to offend him, it's going to disturb him, it's going to leave him distraught to know that my brother is in pain and agony. And if it's your enemy, you're just going to give him a chance to clap hands and rejoice and say, oh really, I'm sorry what happened. And behind your back is like, good it happened, it took long to happen. Sayyidina Imam Shafi Rahmatullah said that the sign of a hypocrite is that he praises you in your presence and he speaks ill of you in your absence and he rejoices over your pain. That's the sign of a hypocrite. In your presence, he, he flatters you. He flatters you and he thrills you. You're amazing like this. And behind your back, he backbites about you. Then Qadi Shuraih told this person, Wanzur ila aini. Look at this eye of mine. Wa ashara ila ihda aynayhi. And then he pointed to one of his eyes and he said, ما أبصرت بها طريقا ولا شخصا منذ خمس عشرة سنة وما أخبرت بها أحد إلا أنت في هذه الساعة. Did you see this eye of mine? I have lost my vision in it totally. By Allah, I haven't seen a human, nor have I seen the road, nor have I seen any creature for the last fifteen years with this eye. And I have not mentioned this to anyone but you today to teach you the lesson that you only complain to Allah and no one else. I'm flying and I read this. It hit me so hard. I said, look at the lives of these people. Look at the lives of these people. Ma absartu biha rajulan wala shakhsan. I haven't seen anyone, any human, any person for 15 years. But I haven't mentioned this to anyone but you, and this is at this time. And then he said, mashkaka. Make Allah the point of whom you empty your heart out to, to whom you cry. So that's the second thing that we learn from children. Remember we said our beginning is ignorance. Allah can snatch. Uh, I know of a person who had loss of memory and then what a type of challenge that he had in his life. He lost the concept of gender as old age set in. So he wouldn't differentiate between male and female. There are different types of loss of memory, Alzheimer's, short memory, long, long memory, etc. May Allah preserve our faculties. The third thing that I learned from children, Imam Suyuti says, يَأْكُلُونَ مُجْتَمِعِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ مُجْتَمِعِينَ That you would notice children, they eat together. They have a sense of togetherness in them. They never scattered. They sit together, they play together. Whatever they do, they do it together. There was a friend of mine, his son was admitted in a clinic and then him and his wife went to visit the child and uh, was in the pediatric ward. So the mom went and comforted the child and hugged the child. And then the child looked at the mom and said, mom, but that's not fair. So she's like, why my baby? You need to kiss all the children in the ward. You need to kiss all the children. To the child, this is one. We together. You know, we often say, and somebody mentioned a very amazing thing, we say that uh, society has poisoned our children's mind, their peers have indoctrinated them, etc. But the Prophet ﷺ says, Kullu mauludin yuladu ala al -fitra. A child is born with the natural ability of the deen. فَأَبَوَاهُ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ it is the parents who then change the faith and the thinking and influence the children. So society might add to that negative influence, but we as the caregivers, as the custodians of the children, we are directly responsible for molding or shaping that child. 
The Sahaba complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Oh Prophet of Allah, our food is running short. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't ask which pot you're cooking in. Uh, or what ingredients you're using. The first thing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La'allakum, I think perhaps you are eating scattered. The first question, O oh, Nabi of Allah, our food is running short. Our food is running short. The first thing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you are eating scattered. Eat together, eat together. The Sahaba's level of consciousness was amazing. Right? Allah makes mention of this in the 18 Jews. So sometimes, uh, able Sahabi had, was concerned eating with a crippled Sahabi. The able Sahabi felt that, you know what? The crippled Sahabi will arrive late for the meal and by that time food will be short. The crippled Sahabi said, no, no, I have a disability so I might occupy the seat of two while the able man will be only occupying the seat of one. So I might be infringing on the rights of others. Look at the level of taqwa. Now he's driving fast by go slow. No, he got brakes. He got brakes. So he must do the stop. In, 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 in Sahaba, each one's taqwa is making him restrain himself. Each man's consciousness of Allah. The visually impaired Sahabi is concerned, can I eat with the sighted Sahabi? Why? Because I'm visually impaired, I'm blind, I might eat more than my allotted share. The sighted Sahabi is saying, the blind man, he'll eat less. The healthy Sahabi is concerned of eating with the sick one, he's sick, he'll eat less. How much will he eat? He's healthy, he's not good. This one is concerned of that, that one is concerned. Allah revealed the verse, لَيْسَ عَلَى الْأَعْمَى حَرَجٌ وَلَا عَلَى الْأَعْرَجِ حَرَجٌ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرِيضِ حَرَجٌ وَلَا, أن ت... ولا عَلَى أَنفُسِكُمْ أَن تَأْكُلُوا مِن بُيُوتِكُمْ أَوْ بُيُوتِ آبَائِكُمْ There's no harm on you if you eat with the cripple or you eat with the sick or you eat with the blind. You know, whatever it is, that added level of of, of exerting yourself into those minute details, Allah has forgiven you for that. But imagine the consciousness of Sahaba. So what do we learn from the, the children? We learn from them that they are not concerned about sustenance. They move on. I read an article on child psychology and in that uh, psychologist writes, which is so amazing and it is so irrefutable, that you would find when children play, they tire out adults quickly. They have stamina, four, five-year-old child will tire out, he's playing with his grandfather, where are you, there are you, where are you, then after a little while, go, your, your nanny is calling you. Someone said, which is that visitor, jiske aane se bhi khushi, jane se bhi khushi. There's one type of visitor who's coming also makes you happy and they going also is grandchildren. When they come also, you get very happy and after a little while, I think your parents are missing you. So you need your space as well. Then he goes to his father, plays with his dad, tires him out. Goes to his mom, plays with his mom, tires him out. Goes to his elder sibling, plays with him, tires him out. But the child's got stamina. Why? So they did a critical analogy of this here. What is in the child that keeps the child running at optimum level? And the answer was that a child when he's playing, he or she is playing wholeheartedly with mind, body and soul. Whereas the average human is lamenting the past, planning the future and half-heartedly playing in the present. So that is why the mind is not there. We, we like, yeah, 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 what you said, yeah, 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 I love you, my baby. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 so nice, so nice. You know, that is how we're playing and this is why we've lost the moment. And in English they say that the, the, the past is, is, is history, the future is a mystery and the present is a gift. That's why they call it a present tense. Because it's a present, it's a gift. And that's what life is about. Make the best of it because this is the moment. So the children, the first thing we learn from them, la yahtamuna bir rizq. They're not concerned about wealth and income. Number two, wa idha maridu la yashkuna min khaliqihim. When a child becomes sick, a child is not complaining against his Allah. Number three, ya'kuluna mujtami'een. They eat together. Number four, wa idha khafu salat. When a child becomes afraid, becomes anxious, becomes stressed, then a child starts crying. A child cries. 
Where's tears in our life, my brothers? Where's tears in our life? If a person cannot cry, then there's something seriously wrong with his spirituality. Such happenings around the world, such catastrophes that have rocked the planet, such painful things that have opened up, and we see it, we witness it, we hear it, but there's just no tears. We read the Quran how much? Salih Muzani says, قرأت القرآن على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في المنام. I read the Quran to the Nabi of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم in a dream. The Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said, يا صالح هذه القراءة فأين البكاء؟ صالح, you read the Quran, but where's the tears? Where's tears? One of the pious predecessors was asked, إننا نستفيد من درسك أكثر من غيرك. You know, there's something amazing about you. When I attend your talk, I benefit from your lectures more than others. What's the wisdom? He says, Inni aqra'u ashrata ajza min al-Qur'ani qabla al-fajri bi qasdi an yanfa'a Allahu al-Muslimina bima atahaddath. Every morning before coming for fajr, I read 10 juz of the Qur'an so that Allah can put effect in the words when I speak to the audience. Somebody said in the Urdu language, इंसान पहचाना जाता है आमाल से वरना अच्छी बातें तो दीवार पे भी लिखी होती है इंसान पहचाना जाता है आमाल से वरना अच्छी बातें तो दीवार पे भी लिखी हुई होती है A man is recognized, identified, he becomes worthy of merit through आमाल But a good statement, oh that you'll find it on a wall also man, you'll find it on a bumper sticker also man You'll find it behind some, you know, thousand places. There's so many coatable coats you will find. That doesn't make you great. If there's anything that makes you great, it's amal and action. And that is what differentiates man from anyone else. Let us be honest and ask ourselves, when last did we cry? Uh, you look at a child, a child cries. This is a na'mat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This tear is a bounty. When the Prophet sallallahu stood at the side of the body of Ibrahim radiallahu anhu, the child that was born to him from Maria Qibtiya radiallahu anhu, he started crying. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu nudged him and he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I don't want to be insensitive. But I thought tears was a sign of weakness. You're the best of Allah's creation. What's this crying about? He said, Hadi rahmatun ja'alaha Allahu fi qulubil ibad. These tears is a mercy that Allah has put in the hearts of man. These tears is a mercy that Allah has put in the hearts of man. And then the Prophet Sallallahu in his eloquent way, in his comprehensive way, he outlined the obligation to the child and he also outlined the limit. He said, Inna al-ayna tadma' wal-qalbu yahzun wa la naqoolu illa ma yarda bihi rabbuna wa inna bi firaqika ya Ibrahim la mahzunun. No human in two words can encapsulate the emotion the father experiences on the demise of his child. And yet the religious obligation to his creator, like our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it at the demise of his son. He said the eye is tearing and the heart is throbbing, but the tongue only utters that with which my Allah is happy. And make no mistake, Ibrahim, your separation has left me restless. So what's the fourth quality about children? When they become in panic or fear or they tense. Salat uyunuhum biddumu. Salat uyunuhum biddumu. You would see the tears will just trickle down from their eyes. And the fifth thing, wa idha takhasamu tasara'u ila sulhi. Children, when they argue and they have a squabble, then before they sleep, they reconcile. Children, you know, no, I don't like him. He troubles me, he fights with me. And next day they patched up and they're going together. And that is why parents should be wise and calculated not to embroil themselves in the arguments of kids. Tomorrow he comes out in the street to play. There is nobody else but that same friend and they're together and they're playing together. But unfortunately today adults will go on for, um, for years. I quote those couplets so often and it's apt to say it again. بچپن میں اپنے بائیں سے دن میں دس مرتبہ لڑتے تھے مگر سونے سے پہلے گلے لگاتے تھے برے ہو کے جو ایک مرتبہ لڑے تو دس سال تک بات نہیں کرتے 
that in my childhood when I had an altercation with my brother and my sibling before sleeping, we would embrace each other and we would retire to bed and we were brothers and we were together and that was the bond and that was life and we were inseparable. You know, in, in Mishkat, in the first volume under Babu Dafni al Mayyit, there is this uh, narration, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Mulaika makes mention of it, where Aisha radiallahu anha, when she left Medina and she came for Hajj, then she passed by the grave of a brother, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr, the son of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And she said, if I was present at your demise, I wouldn't have passed by your grave. But I wasn't present, I was in Medina when you passed away, oh my brother. So I just want to pass by and I just want to say my respect. And then she sang a few couplets. This is in Mishkat in first volume under Babu Dafni al-Mayyid. The breakdown and the backdrop of this is very intense. In essence, there was a king by the name of Jadima and he had two ministers and they ruled under his leadership for 40 years. And people said, These two are inseparable. But life moved on and one passed away and the other one gradually found his independence. And then it appeared to him, it looks like I had never met my brother and my minister ever in life. That is how life moved on. That that's the nature of life. Today you are so close, things evolve, change, married, move on, different continent, different province, different place, and the entire family structure breaks away. So these are the five amazing qualities that children have. Imam Suyuti Rahmatullah says, if adults can adopt this, imbibe this, internalize this, what they create, they would be the sage of the age. They would be the friends of Allah. May Allah give us the ability to internalize it. I wanted to share with you some amazing points from the life of Yusuf salam because I was reading one kitab very recently and it stood out and just walk you through these points as well. Uh, because it's rich in meaning and it has so much guidance for us all. The first thing the ulama say Yusuf alayhi salam had 10 amazing qualities as a synopsis of his life. And we need to empower ourselves. We need to learn and there's no better person to learn than the lives of Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. Because they were fashioned, groomed and shaped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first salient feature in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam was al-iffatu anish shahwa. He lived the life of morality, of chastity, of integrity, of fidelity and loyalty. In English they say it's more important to be faithful than famous. Today it's more about fame than being faithful. Al-iffatu shahwa To be faithful, this is what Allah loves. There's nothing more beloved to Allah than modesty. Ibn al jawzi rahimahullah has made mention of an incident that there was a woman living in Mecca, a woman of exceptional beauty. So one day she was looking in the mirror and she was admiring herself. Probably if you, you know what I'm talking. Nothing if you're a married man. It's, it's a common sight and, and good luck and uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, and look at the teachings of the Prophet wasallam. Even at that time, Allah, you've adorned, you've beautified, you've decorated my appearance, Allah. Beautify my character. And the Prophet wasallam said it's a hadith of its own. A believer is a mirror to a believer. And then the ulama have written in, in Mirqat, Mullah Ali Qari rahmatullah has made 10 deductions between a believer and a mirror. Right? What happens? There are so many things on your body which you cannot see without the aid of a mirror. If a person has a scar on his cheeks or he goes to the barber, he wants to see the hair on his nape, he uses one mirror, two mirror, and he get an idea. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, all in order. In the very same way, a believer to another brother, he guides him, he shows him his weaknesses, he advises him. He 
that whenever you err, you lose your direction, how a mirror shows you in the very same way your brother will guide you, motivate you and inspire you. Just one, two things and then we move on back to the hadith that I was, uh, the, the incident I was speaking about. The second thing about a mirror is, yuri'uyubahu kama hiya min duni tahweelin aw tafkhimin. A mirror would show you your weaknesses as it is. It doesn't exaggerate it. If there is a pigmentation and a scar here on one cheek, it's not going to show you on both the cheeks. It won't show you on one cheek. There's a problem here, that's it. It's not going to show you magnified unless you go to those other mirrors, you know, where you oblong and you look uh, different. A mirror will reflect it as it is. The third thing about a mirror, إِذَا غِبْتَ عَنْهُ زَالَتْ سُورَتُكْ When you leave the mirror, your image has been captured and it's done. The next person that comes, the mirror doesn't whisper who was here before you. Hey, just as well you came and that guy was really fat. The mirror doesn't whisper anything to the next person about the previous person. The mirror contain. Look, look, at, look at the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One hadith and how many deductions. This is the amazing speech and this is how profound the knowledge and the wisdom of, of, of Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is. And this is how rich the, 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 the teachings of deen are. And that is why we need to sit with the scholars of hadith, those who have devoted their lives, those who are the true people, you know, who have committed the sciences of hadith. So anyway, the woman is looking into the mirror and she's admiring herself. And then she nudges her husband and she says, Oh my beloved, أَتَرَى أَحَدْ يَرَى هَذَا الْوَجْهَ وَلَا يَفْتَتِنُ بِهِ Do you think there's a man who would look at my beauty and not be mesmerized? Do you think there's a man who would see my charm, my charisma, my beauty and it will not tickle his fantasy? So he said, yes, Ubaid ibn Umair. Ubaid ibn Umair, he's a man like that. Oh really? Okay. So then give me a permission. فَلَأُفَتِّنَنَّهُ I will mislead him. I will seduce him. He said, it's fine, you can go. He was a great scholar and she lived in Mecca. Ibn al-Jawzi has made mention of it. I read it in his writings myself. فَأَتَتْهُ كَالْمُسْتَفْتِيَ So she comes to the haram. And she approaches this great scholar and she says, Sheikh, your excellency, your majesty, uh, I have a question to ask you. فَخَلَى مَعَهَا فِي نَاحِيَةِ الْمَسْجِدِ So they move to a side, respectfully, not in isolation or seclusion, so that she may ask the question. فَأَسْفَرَتْ عَنْ وَجْهٍ مِثْلَ فَلْقَةِ الْقَمَرِ So she unveils herself and it is the beauty of a moon that is unveiled before him. So immediately he drops his gaze and he steps aside. And he says, Ya Amat Allah, istatiri. O sister, O servant of Allah, please just drop your veil and cover yourself. So she says, Inni futin tubik. Okay, I must tell you, I'm infatuated, infatuated over you. I have a crush over you. What we said, the first quality in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam was al ifatu anish shahwa. Modesty, chastity, morality, integrity, fidelity. May Allah bless it to us. It's easy for me to speak. And, you know, speaking doesn't make me any more better than you. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said that لا تأمنن على النساء ولو أخا ما في الرجال على النساء أمين لا تأمنن على النساء ولو أخا Don't trust any man, even if it's your sibling, to say, no, that's safe, that is fine, he's a member of the family. I haven't found any man clean and pure, chaste and noble in the matter of the opposite gender. These are the words of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. And can you imagine that error and this error? So anyway, he says to her, Inni sa'iluki an shay'in fa in anti sadaqtini nadartu fi amrik. Okay, sister, I'm going to ask you a few questions. If you're honest to me, then I will consider your request. You're saying that you have a crush over me and you're infatuated. We can look into that subsequently. But just answer a few questions of mine. Are you okay with it? I said, yes. لو أتاك ملك الموت ليقبض روحك أكان يسرك أني قضيتها لك Just imagine 
you wish to meet with me in isolation, you have a crush over me, we meet in seclusion, and this meeting of isolation is interrupted by the sudden presence of the angel of death. Would you be comfortable with the action you perpetrating? Allahumma la, no, no, never, ever. Sadaqti, I appreciate your honesty. That is why I often say, these friends of Allah, they had a greater level of consciousness in an environment of temptation than we have of Allah in an environment of piety. The Sahaba were more conscious, obedient, compliant to Allah in their weddings than we are in our funerals. They obeyed Allah. Wedding is a place where, you know what, you go on a spree and you indulge and you make the best of it. It's my only daughter, it's my first daughter, it's my last daughter. They were more conscious of the orders of Allah in their weddings than we are in our funerals. Funeral is a place you want to be compliant, you want to do everything. Is the body face in Qibla? What the color sheet must we use? Um, do we have to make ghusl? Do we make wudu? What's the protocol? What's the procedure? By Allah, they were more obedient in their weddings to Allah than we are in our marriages. Okay, so this is the second question. You entered into your grave. And the angels come and awaken you and revive you. And your interrogation starts. Would you be comfortable to know that you have that liability in your bad deeds? That you have indulged in immorality? Allahumma la. No, not at all. Okay, it's the day of Qiyamah. And the book of deeds have been given out. La tadreen. You are clueless. If you're going to receive your book in your right hand or your left hand, at that time when you're dreading, you're skeptical, you're apprehensive, you're anxious, you're uneasy, would you be happy to know that in your book of deeds there is this demerit that has been captured and recorded? Allahumma la. Not at all. Fattaqillah. Fa inna Allah qad ahsana ilayki wa an'ama alayki. Then, sister, stop this of yours. Stop this of yours. I was in Canada now. And then uh, I gave a talk to some sisters and then uh, there was a Q&A and then a sister said that, you know, I'm living in an environment and I'm happy with my husband, but unfortunately I have developed some feelings for a man in the neighborhood and I'm trying my level best to contain myself, but unfortunately it's left me restless. Please advise. So I first told the sister, may Allah reward you for your honesty. Of course, it was in an anonymous capacity, so we don't know who we're speaking about. But, but we, if we don't ask, when will we learn? And then I advise the, the ulama have written, amongst many things, a person should reflect daily over this ayah, muraqaba of the ayah. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Don't you realize Allah is watching? Don't you realize Allah is aware? Are you not conscious that Allah is watching what you're doing? جو تو کرتا ہے اہلِ جہاں سے چھپ کر کوئی دیکھتا ہے تجھے آسمان سے which you do hidden what you do hidden from the eye of people obviously the eye of Allah is on you and then I said to her and this I read in the writings of Hakim al-Ummah that as humans we have to make an effort not to succumb to the crave so it is not evil to have the crave, it is evil to succumb to the crave. The crave itself is not evil because we are humans, we're fallible mortals. That's going to happen and that is not sinful. Nobody aspires to fast in the month of Ramadan without feeling hungry. That make dua das Ramadan, I mustn't feel hungry. Make dua das Ramadan, I mustn't feel thirsty. No, that's not an aspiration because it's not human, it's natural. The key thing is I mustn't succumb to the hunger. So the challenge will continue. That's inevitable. That's inevitable. Uh, Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates 5,374 ahadith and he makes this dua daily. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an azni. Oh Allah save me from zina. And someone said, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, you've been the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So many ahadith and you ask in protection. He said, كَيْفَ آمُنُ عَلَى نَفْسِي وَإِبْلِيسُ حَيُّنْ How can I sigh with relief when the devil is alive and kicking? When the devil is alive and kicking, how can I sigh with relief? I need to take my precaution and make dua. So he said, oh sister, make dua to Allah and be grateful for what Allah has given you. In Qasasul Mutazawwijin wal Mutazawwijat, I read an amazing tale that in the previous nations there was this uh, uh, king and there was this farmer. And uh, 
the king was living his royal life, living a life of wealth and affluence, and the farmer, you know, living, breaking even and living his simple life. One day the king's gaze fell on the farmer's wife and he became infatuated and he developed a feeling. So then he sent someone to her and he said to her that, listen, um, if you come out of the marriage of your husband, then I will give you a royal life. I will drape you with silk and jewelry and comfort you and give you all ease and luxury. So now this was playing in the back of her mind. So the husband comes home. She's now hostile. She's unpleasant. She's aggressive. She's not compliant. Oh my wife, what kind of behavior is this? No, well, this is the new me. This is the new me, like it or not. And gradually it kept on moving on until finally he prov she provoked her, him into a divorce and he divorced her. The, the, the incident continues. I told you where I read it. And then he then gets married to her. When they meet. But remember, you've broken a marriage. You've hurt a person. His curse has gone up. You've interfered in the private life of a person. This is going to have negative consequences. And now they're going to indulge in that moment of fantasy, what they were dreaming and planning for. He and she both divinely are deprived of their sight. And then they become paralyzed. And then now you realize that what you had, simple and basic, which was going good, was far better than this, you know, um, assuming or fantasizing, which is only in the air and has no reality to it. So the first quality in the life of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam was al-ifatu an shahwa Our deen is very beautiful and pragmatic. There are instances where we have to interact with the opposite gender, but Allah teaches us the tale in the Quran that when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam came to Madian and he seen the people with their flock at the well and he seen two girls standing at the side and he was moved by morality and he said, Ma khatubukuma. Oh sisters, what's the matter? So there is this element, this concern. So they said, no, no, we cannot get into the crowd because there are men there and we don't want to rub shoulders. So he's driven by sympathy and empathy and he takes the flock and then he goes and gives it water and he sets them off. And that's it. And the girls return home and the dad is like, Ma ya bintaya. What brings you come home early today? No, we met a man who was very kind to us. Well, then you born in the house of Nabu, you know, if somebody is kind, learn to reciprocate, learn to acknowledge, learn to thank. This is so fundamental. When I was in Houghton and I used to give dars after Maghrib, so one day I spoke about acknowledgement and reciprocation. There was a brother in the audience in the corporate world he said, I took that advice just to appreciate and acknowledge and I climbed the economic ladder so rapidly that from a regular employee, I'm now sitting as the floor manager and everybody had kind words purely because of this quality of appreciation and, 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 and uh, acknowledging people and reciprocating others. It's not like they're going to you know, give you some royalties out of what the income is, but anyway, I'm happy for you. You know, one of my teachers say, people come to you and they say, listen, I have a court case, please make dua, everything goes well, and it's millions of money, you make a dua, you tell him what to read, it works out well, then in the end you might get a box of chocolates or at its best, maybe some nice uh, frame. So when he gets home, when she gets home, what does the father say? You should go and call him. And the Quran says, فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَا she came to call him, but she came so modest, the Quran adopts an expression like she was walking or riding on modesty. She was modest, she was toned down, she was humble. She said, Inna abi yad'uka li yajziyaka ajra ma saqayta lana, O oh stranger, O oh brother, my dad is calling you to compensate you. And he had made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he goes and the tale continues and Musa alayhi salatu was salam then meets with Shweb alayhi salam and he's wedded to the daughter and the nikah continues. So there are moments of interaction but we can do it with, with, with modesty. Now what was the modesty of Yusuf alayhi salam when we move on to the next one? He was so modest, listen to this, the woman who seduced him and the entire tale the Quran speaks about, 
ultimately she said ana rawattuhu an nafsi let me divulge the reality i seduce him but the man is absolutely amazing his integrity just cannot be flawed then the entire woman of egypt said ma alimna alayhi min su we cannot find fault with the modesty and the morality of this man in any way imagine the testimony of the woman of your neighborhood who's going to have that honor you won't even cross the boundaries of your own house the second quality in the life of yusuf alayhi salatu was salam wad'u lini fi mawdi'ihi wa shiddatu fi mawdi'iha he had the fine balance between gentleness and sternness before i endeavor to expound on that let me say one of the most difficult things in life is striking the balance nobody said when you get married abandon your mom but now you need to strike the balance between mom and partner nobody said when you reform and rehabilitate your life that's the end of recreation but the aim is getting the balance in place moderate indulgence in recreation is part of our teachings and that's the balance of our deen that is the balance of our deen the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had paid abu darda wa salman radhiyallahu anhu so the muakhad that had taken place so one day salman radhiyallahu anhu came to visit abu darda and sahaba were very natural and very honest and clean life they were no you know they 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 were not superficial they were not fake they were pure So when he came and Umm Darda the wife of Abu Darda opened the door for Umm Darda mutabaddila he found that Umm Darda radhiyallahu anha was dressed very shabby and untidy so he said what's the matter Umm Darda why are you dressed like this year a person at an odd hour with an overall or a cap or something strange you're like is all in order is everything fine is it okay so what's the matter so Umm Darda radhiyallahu anha said اخوك ابو الدرداء ليس له حاجه في الدنيا يا برادر ابو الدرداء he's got no inclination to anything material he's got no attachment or in, uh, inclination to anything material and by the way the ulama say taking active measures to enhance your relationship is not part of dunya but is part of deen the khulafa rashidin had the greatest level of deen and they all had multiple spouses the khulafa rashidin were the most actively involved in deen so this is not a worldly commitment this is a religious engagement of course if it's done and governed by the values of islam anyway then salman radhiyallahu anhu came for sana'a ta'am and he prepared food and he presented it to um, abu darda radhiyallahu anhu came he prepared food and he presented it to salman he said uh, kul ana sa'im eat i am fasting so salman radhiyallahu anhu said ma ana bi akil hatta ta'kul i'm not going to eat till you don't join me So he insisted he broke his optional fast and he ate. فلما كان الليل when it was night ذهب ليقوم. Abu Darda said okay Salman I'll see you I'm going to go now perform salah. So Salman رضي الله عنه said no no you go to your wife and you go sleep now. So he went and slept. After a little while he got up again and he started performing salah. Salman رضي الله عنه said you go back and sleep. فلما كان آخر الليل I'm saying one of the most greatest challenges of life is balance. To strike the balance in order. The narration is in Hayatus Sahaba in Kitabul Ilm in the fourth volume that uh, Umar ibn Qais Umar ibn Qais he says Ibn Zubair his life was such kuntu idha nadartu ila dunyahu qultu hadha rajulun lam yurid ad-din tarfat ayn wa idha nadartu ila dinihi qultu hadha rajulun lam yurid ad-dunya tarfat ayn that ibn zubair when i looked at his mundane and worldly activities he was so engrossed so committed so calculated i said look like this man is immersed in this world he has no religious interest but when i would see how he'll give his zakat how charitable he was how he would perform his salah how he would read his quran i would say this man has no interest in the world so he did everything with the perfect balance if you look at our lives you'll conclude this man has no interest in anything he's got no interest in anything because you know what sluggish in the world also sluggish in deen also non productive at home also uh, you know what nothing nothing just not product producing on any level
Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu said, Inni la ubghidu rajula an yakuna farigan, laysa fi amal al-dunya wa la fi amal al-akhirah. If there's something I despise is to find a person not doing something about deen, no dunya. Ulima minhu annahu man laysa lahu ishtigalun diniyun, fal yashtagil bil amri al-dunya wil dunya. The Muhaddithin write under the commentary of these statements of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that if you're not engaged in something deen constructive, do something of this dunya permissible and constructive. I often say, if you can't earn Jannat by helping people, at least earn Jannat by not harming them. If you can't earn Jannat by helping people and taking du'as, just earn Jannat by not hurting them. Inshallah, that way also you'll make your Jannat. So then in the morning, Salman radiallahu anhu goes to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, oh, Nabi, uh, Abu Darda goes to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, oh, Nabi of Allah, last night Salman came and he stopped me and he told me that I must be close to my partner and I must spend the night in ibadat also and I must sleep. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, oh Abu Darda, in one narration, Salman has a better understanding of deen than you. What he said is absolutely correct. That is the beauty. That is the pragmatic nature of our deen. That is the user-friendly nature of our deen. So what was the second amazing quality in the life of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam? The balance between sternness and harshness. When to be gentle, when to be stern. To strike that fine balance. And for that we need knowledge. We need knowledge and understanding. So just to put it into perspective, when he assumed the throne of Egypt, and his brothers came and they came in desperation and they came for corn and grain and then he quizzed them you don't have another brother no we have a brother but you know what we lost him so our father keeps the other brother as a form of comfort and solace obviously yusuf alayhi salam was pining to see that brother of his so he then encouraged them but in two verses he displayed gentleness and sternness and that's the balance we need to adopt in our life we need hope and fear of Allah. If, each, if any one of that overpowers the other, there will be an imbalance in life. If we start fearing Allah without hoping, we'll give up hope. No, no, my salah is not accepted. What I ate is probably not halal. Uh, my income is not perfect. Uh, my tilawat is... You lose hope. You'll become despondent. And if you start only hoping, then the Prophet ﷺ said, well, man hawa ha wa tamanna ala Allahi al -amani. He's feeble, he's helpless, he's hopeless, who only does wrong and he invests hopes in Allah. He does sin and then he's optimistic that Allah, yarjuna rahmatahu wa yakhafuna adaba. They optimistic of the mercy of Allah, yet they fear the punishment of Allah. So Yusuf ﷺ said to his brothers, just to move on, this time is running out. Listen the next time you come because it's seven years of drought so you need to come for a refill. Bring your brother with also please. That brother of yours please bring him. Don't you see how hospitable I am and what a good host. So what's that kindness, gentleness, motivation. But then after that he sounded a warning. Listen, the next time you come, if you don't bring your brother, do yourself a favor and don't come yourself. Listen, my boy, I love you. You've seen how I appreciate it. Exactly, I need you to be performing salah and we're going to be doing it together. But listen, if you're going to persist on omitting salah, then do yourself a favor not to ask me for a favor beyond. So to find the fine balance in life, to find the fine balance in life, to, to, to eat, to indulge, to restrain, to manage, to sleep, to offer prayer, to have family time. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ with all his spouses every day apart from where he was sleeping. And I've seen this in the life of many of the pious people. The time between Asr was a quick visit to all the Azwaj Mutahharat, thereby just touching base with each one. Just touching base, catching up, how it is, passing time and moving through. So he would spend his night, which he would rotate and alternate. But after Asr was a quick time with his spouses. And Aisha radiallahu anha says uh, that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would get up. The narration is in Muslim Sharif. He would get up early, then he would offer his eight rakat salah. 
of tarawih, of, 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 of tahajjud. La tas'al an husnihin wa tulihin. Oh man, Aisha radiallahu anha said, don't even ask me how lengthy that salah was and how beautiful it was. I, I don't have the words. Then he would complete that. For in kuntu mustaqidatan, Muslim Sharif, after completing, if I was up, then he would have a little chit chat with me. He would just talk with me. Aisha, are you fine? Are you good? What's happening? He would talk. He would discuss. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Bilal radiallahu anhu would call out the adhan. And then he would offer the two units of Fajr Sunnah. Then he would rest slightly. And then of course the Fajr Salah would start. But that was the nature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha Allah says, he would hop into the bed. And I just marvel beyond words at how perfectly Allah had groomed the, the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, one of the things that I marvel amongst others is that how the Prophet ﷺ could impress 124,000 Sahaba and, and all those that had assembled, leaving each one with the impression that I'm the most beloved. Right? And four children, each one thinks I love the other one the most. And that Sahabi came running, O Prophet of Allah, ayyu nasi ahabbu ilayk. O Nabi of Allah, who do you love the most? And Nabi Wasallam said, Aisha. So he said, no, minar rijal, I'm speaking from the men. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Abu, huh? her father. So the ulama say, he asked the question, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the academic reply, but the motivation of his question was the perception that he was the most beloved. You don't ever go ask that, yeah, wait, ask my father, who's his blue-eyed boy? You, wait, you ask the old man. You're only going to say that when you have that confidence about yourself, that's the only time. Obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to give the answer which was the truth, whoever was the most beloved to him. But the notion that he had left each person. So Aisha radiallahu anha said he would hop into the bed. And look at the honor of Aisha radiallahu anha. And we green with envy. Hatta lasiqa jilduhu bi jildi. Hatta lasiqa jilduhu bi jildi. She would say we were now bone with bone. Flesh with flesh. Skin with skin. We touching. We holding. We cuddling. We together. With who? With Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then so often he would say, Ya Aish, Hada Jibreel, Yaqra'u alayki salam. Aish, one minute Jibreel just came to meet me and Jibreel gave salams to you. Jibreel gave salams to you. Which language can give you adequate expression to encapsulate this honor? Then he would hop in, he would talk to me and update. And then when he would think that I have fallen off to sleep, then he would sneak out. Then it was him, his Lord, and the night. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْصَبْ فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْصَبْ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ When you've completed the duty of conveying the message, فَنْصَبْ Stand erected in prayer. نَصَبْ means tiredness, fatigue. So in other words, exert yourself to, exert yourself to a level of fatigue. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ And incline towards your Lord. I quote these words of Sayyidina Umar often when the Muslims were fighting in Alexandria and Muawiyah ibn Khudayj was the envoy and it was midday and Umar radiallahu was resting and he had told the slave girl, Labina, I stand for correction, was it her or someone else, that when the envoy comes, bring him to me, I need to know. He was so anxious. He was pacing up and down. What's the update of the Muslims? What's the update? We got our people pacing for score. What's the latest? How many wickets down? How many goals? Uh, pacing up and down, anxious, biting their nails. It's a crunch moment. Okay? And then what happened? They're eating crunchy. Okay, good luck. So he's pacing and then he sits there one side. And then Muawiyah ibn Khudayj comes and he goes to, he says it's midday, siesta, Umar radiallahu anhu will be resting. So let me come later. The slave girl gets wind that he's returned. So she goes to him and says, no, Umar is waiting. So tells him, come quickly. He's then summoned. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, you came to Medina, I'm waiting, you go and rest till I have to send someone to you. So he said, my apologies, O Amir al-Mu'minin, I thought it's midday, time to sleep. So I'll come when you get up from your midday sleep. He said, In nimtu layla dayyatu nafsi wa in nimtu nahara dayyatu ra'iyya fa kayfa noom bayna hadaini ya mu'awiyah. 
Muawiyah, if I sleep by night, when will I be chatting with Allah? And if I sleep by day, when will I be discharging the obligation of the creation and the subjects? With these two obligations upon me, you find me the time and I'll put my head on the pillow. You find me the time. Today we can just sleep for hours and hours. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz had assumed Khilafah, he said, listen, I had a great night busy with the burial of Abdul Malik. So I'm tired. He put a butler at the door. Nobody is to interfere. When I get up for Zohar, I'll get into office and work will start. So he barely gets into his room and there's a knock on the door. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, it's his son. He said, you know, tell my dad I need to speak to him. So the message is communicated. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz says, tell my son that I am, you know, tired now. Whole night I haven't slept. I just need some rest. When I settle and I feel refreshed, I will come out. So he said, okay, just go and whisper in my dad's ears, Man laka bi anta'isha ila dhahri. Dad, I'm only asking you, what's your guarantee that you will live till Zohar? You've come into office, you're responsible. They say, that word, ataratin nawma min bayni aynayhi, took sleep out of the eyes of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz for his entire period. He said, call that son of mine. He embraced him. He said, Alhamdulillah, alladhi akhraj min sulbi, man yu'inuni ala deeni. Allah, I'm grateful you've created from my loin and my back children who steer me when I deviate. So anyway, we were saying that the second quality is to strike the balance in life, to get that balance in life. The third quality that's amazing in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam, and I try and move a little quick and expedite it, is the quality of al-hilm, tolerance. My brother, wallah, there's nothing greater needed to rescue our marriages than tolerance. Allah loves forgiveness, pardon, and tolerance. The Prophet ﷺ said, you could pay any two qualities. You know, you say he's young and he's handsome. You say he's got a beautiful voice and he's got a beautiful demeanor. You say he's wealthy and he's generous. But the Prophet ﷺ said, ما جمع شيء إلى شيء أحسن من حلم إلى علم. You cannot pay any two greater qualities than knowledge and tolerance. That's the best two qualities you can pay up. So just understand the level of tolerance, حلم in the life of Yusuf ﷺ. So the story is long. Binyamin comes and then the plan is devised, and Allah says, "We devised this plan for Yusuf." So once Allah devised it and Allah made it, it's completely, there's no issues. كَذَلِكَ كِدْنَا لِيُوسُفْ كَذَلِكَ كِدْنَا لِيُوسُفْ مَا كَانَ لِيَأْخُذَ أَخَاهُ فِي دِينِ الْمَلِكِ So the vessel of the king is put in the luggage of, the, of, of Binyamin and then off they go. And then a person calls out and says, إِنَّكُمْ لَسَارِقُونَ That I think you have stolen something. Academically, there's so much write up, but it's going to take up too much time, so I get to the point. So, anyway, they are summoned and they are brought back and they start going through the luggage. Systematically, they go through the luggage of the other brothers so that it doesn't give a leak or a hint. So, they start everybody else's, and finally, they come to the luggage of Yusuf salam, and um, uh, Binyamin, the brother, and lo and behold, there is the vessel. So when this utensil and vessel, suwa al-malik, the, 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 the utensil from which the king would drink is, is removed, and the brothers are now, they drop their heads down in embarrassment. Oh, man, this brother of ours, he's a thief. But your majesty and your excellency, forgive us, you know, he's a thief. He had a brother by the name of Yusuf, he was also a thief. And you saying this to the man in his face, and the Quran says, For Asarraha Yusuf fi nafsi. Yusuf salam concealed this without revealing it in any way. Which man? You have in a family meeting and there is this accusation and allegation and argument and counter argument. And then he tells her and she tells him and they tell one another. And here there's a blatant accusation being hurled at you. Which one can hold his calmness and composure, remain balanced and measured, calculated and methodical in the midst of a brazen accusation that's hurled at you? They say, no, no. 
Sorry man, you know he stole and his brother Yusuf also was the same. فَأَسَرَّهَا يُوسُفُ فِي نَفْسِ Yusuf concealed it. وَلَمْ يُبْدِهَا لَهُمْ He didn't whisper it anyway. In his heart he said, أَنْتُمْ شَرُّمْ مَكَانَا You worse. You stole Yusuf from his father. You stole him from his father. What audacity! Who's talking of theft? You know, you get, you get people, you know, no, 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 this is haram. <laughs> haram, haram, haram. Man is running an operation here, you know, broad daylight here. Who doesn't know what he's up to, what his shenanigans, his habits, his practices, it's happening. And then he says, no, 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 no. We need to expose this here. It's haram, it's unlawful, it's impermissible. It's not in keeping with the values of Sharia. I'm saying the level of tolerance I don't have it. I'm only speaking so that I could internalize it myself. So that's the, the third quality in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. So when the Sahaba migrated, um, when they went out in the different campaigns, some Sahaba's family kept them back and said, no, you cannot participate, family, this, that, and they stayed behind. And then Allah revealed the verse, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduwan lakum. Oh, you who believe, some of your spouses and your children are your enemies. Allah didn't say they're not your friends. Allah said they're your enemies. So when this verse was revealed, now they started treading very cautiously, very calculated, behave, because Allah said you are our enemy. So Allah said, what they did was wrong, but the way you're addressing it is no better. The way forward is, you have to forgive, you have to pardon, you have to overlook and embrace the same people. So you can't shun, you can't isolate, you can't exclude, you can't marginalize, you can't disown. That's your own, you have to stand with them. Islam doesn't recognize the word disowning. It doesn't condone the wrong or the, uh, the sin of that son or that family member. But the option of disowning is not on the table of a believer. The ulama have categorically mentioned this. Going forward, ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru. So that's the third thing. The first thing we spoke about morality. Then we spoke about the balance between gentleness and sternness. Then we spoke about tolerance. The fourth thing, thiqatuhu bi nafsihi. Thiqatuhu bi nafsihi, self-confidence. We're living in a world where our youth have no confidence. They cannot make a decision. In English they say a bad decision is better than no decision. Because you're learning to decide. You have a skill. I cannot tell you how many youngsters phone me and if they want to get married. Okay, yeah, it's good, but I'm not sure. But maybe, but I don't know. Hang on, man. Hang on, man. Really? Is that life? Move on. Grow up. Evolve. Embrace. How many people phone me? You know what? My dad's on, on, on the ventilator. They need to take it out. We don't know what to do. We have, Im imagine Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Aisha radiallahu anhu said at the demise of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba, it's in Hayatul Sahaba, she gives the, the amazing description. I don't want to go into the details of that whole narration. They appeared to be like wet sheep. The Sahaba appeared to be like sheep that were wet and they were in a forest that was uh, infested with predators. Because the Prophet Sassam has passed on, it's a volatile situation. People want to latch on to the claiming of prophethood, the volatility. But Abu Bakr with confidence came on and he took on the position. Some said, you know what, uh, no, let, let's go slow, I'll obey Allah, but zakat, we need to, you know, drop it out. And other sahaba said, yeah, Abu Bakr, now, you know what, it's volatile now, let's not insist on, on zakat now, slowly, slowly. And said, now, Abu Bakr radiallahu held Umar and jolted him. A jabbarun fil jahiliya wa khawarun fil Islam. A tyrant in the era of darkness and passive in Islam. Rajautu nusratak, I needed you on my side, not against you. Fa'alimtu anna Allah sharaha sadra Abi Bakrin. I realized this man was strong-headed. He knew what he wanted. Study the greats of the world. Whoever summited the mountains, literally or metaphorically, they had a self-confidence in them. And what was the confidence of Yusuf salam when he was in the jail and the king seen the dream? And he interpreted it. He said, listen, seven years of drought and seven years of prosperity. And the king was now trembling. Okay, now you told me all this here. What must I do? I don't know what to do. Okay, make me in charge and I'll show you what to do. 
We got a lot of people, he's useless. Okay, come over. No, 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 not me. Bye, bye. If I, me, my Surah Fatiha is not in order. My Surah Fatiha is not in order still. You know what? No, no, I'm, uh, you're, not, you're, you're doing a good job. No confidence. Of course, we mustn't be proud. We mustn't be arrogant. But we need to have a sense of confidence. You know, I read the books on oratory. And they say in public speaking and oratory, it makes of a great orator if he can research and rehearse his talk but come across with such confidence like it was spontaneous. Like it was impromptu. It wasn't planned. Just with the level of confidence with which he could mesmerize his audience. Thiqatuhu. We live in a world where our youth are constantly comparing themselves to peers. And they have a slow uh, self-esteem. They have a very low self-esteem. And sometimes we make derogatory remarks which make negative imprints on the subconscious mind of the child. When you analyze it psychologically, from childhood, you know what, we said nasty things, we said derogatory things, we said inflammatory things, and we drop the morale and the self-esteem of the child and we destroy him. So it's imperative for a great human that he has a level of confidence. He can take up, he can evolve, he can steer the ship, he can pilot the aircraft, he can be the, the forerunner, he can come forward. We need people like this. That listen, no, no, there's a crisis. This is what's going to happen in Egypt. Seven years of drought, famine. What do I do? Ijalni ala khaza in il ard. Make me in charge. Inni hafidun alim. And my credentials are the two qualities that are required to run the economy. I have it. Number one, you need to be trustworthy. Number two, you need to have the knowledge, and I have it both. And then it's a tale that just goes on that how Yusuf alayhi salam governed the likes of which has never been repeated. Of course, the Khulafai Rashidin were the Khulafai Rashidin who were unique in their own way. Anyway, to move forward, we could elaborate on each point more. The fifth amazing quality in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam was Quwwatu Dhakra. His amazing ability of intellect and his memory you know they say he has the he, he has the the memory of an elephant so yusuf wasalam, had an amazing memory unfortunately we got memory when it comes to people owing us money who we owe we got a short memory you know our records and everything you know he owed my late father in the 40s you know by you owing him from last week that one, you know what, is cleared out of the way and dropped out. But we remember that. Quwwatu dhakira He had an amazing memory. And today, when it comes to memory, so what was, what was unique about his memory? Things have changed and evolved and life has moved on. You drop the lad in the well and decades have moved on. And time has moved on and you're sitting on the throne. And when you're sitting on the throne, Alamma dakhalu ala Yusuf. People are coming in from far and wide. There's a noble king and he's kind. And people are coming in droves and scores and multitudes. And as he sees them, they, they entered in front of Yusuf. Immediately, without hesitation, on first sight, Yusuf recognizes them. These are my brothers. Of course, he conceals it and he displays an amazing act of kindness, etc. But the intelligence, the ka'un, memory is integral. Today, unfortunately, how often you go back home, I was the talk was amazing. I'm not talking of myself, anybody's. So what was said? Hey, so many things. No, but just like a, a summary. Yeah, it was quite a good thing. Eh? It was, was, was some real meaningful advices. No, but just one, two. Uh, you know, Allahu Akbar, you know, it really made me think. But hang on, man. Hang on, man. Really? There's, there's no degree we talk of. You know what, uh, attention deficit disorder. I think here yeah, we got a memory deficit disorder here. Yeah. There's, there's nothing to be preserved. It's just out of the window, no level. One day I gave a talk. I don't have anything, but I'm just narrating this to you. You know, these are different uh, things that come out. My kids will be here. They heard this. I came back from London the other day. So I got to the traffic light or Pelican Crossing, as they call it in the UK. So I had some coins and a beggar came. And I dropped him a pound. I didn't realize it. Inadvertently, I dropped him a pound. Anyway, I went away. The next day, I came back. Hey, hey, hey. Molani, Molani. You know, some of them in a passionate way. That money you gave me doesn't work. Now, I looked at that coin. That money is only for Port Elizabeth. 
Queen Elizabeth. So I said, no, no, I know, I know what you say, no problem. I, give, give me your coin back, here's it. So I completed my talk. The brother comes to me, says, I want to do a, a SIM swap. I'm just like, caught me off guard. Can I do a SIM swap? He says, no, I want your brain SIM. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> There's nothing to my brain, my brother, but okay. I'm like trying to make sense of what you're saying. There's no secret. May Allah give it to me. May Allah give it to you. The secret of enhancing our memory is that may Allah protect us all from sin. When Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, he says, I wasn't 10 and I completed the Quran. I wasn't 15 when I had memorized the Mu'atta of Imam Malik. And I had memorized by that time 10,000 couplets of only the Hudayl tribe. There's one tribe alone. And then Imam Malik had told me, Inna Allah alqa ala qalbika nooran fala tutfi'hu bil ma'asiyah. That's when Allah has given you a divine light. Keep yourself pure and keep yourself free from sin. Don't extinguish that ability of preserving the text of deen with sin. Don't dilute it. That same Imam Shafi who was so profound, he said, Shakautu ila waki'in su'a hifdi. One day I complained because these great people, their yardstick and, and, and benchmark was different. Shaykh al-Adab, uh, rahimahullah, it's mentioned about him that once he went to a hakim and he said to him, you know what, my body has gone very lame and lazy. Nowadays I have to sleep every night. Oh really? We didn't know that. I have to sleep every night. Because before I could do away with a midday sleep or on the run sleep or nap in the afternoon and I could spend the whole night. Imam Nawawi, the great Shafi'i scholar in the early centuries, he says, Ma wada'tu jambi ala firashi sanatain. For two years, I didn't go to sleep. So like while learning, I fell off to sleep. Like, you know, you say in December time, you know what? I didn't have a meal for the last 10 days. Well, you would be dead, my brother. No, what I mean, I didn't have a meal. We didn't sit down and eat. Two weeks ago, I didn't shower. That was the last. Meaning it was just a splash and I'm running. I'm not having a proper shower. I'm not having a decent meal. He said, for two years, I didn't consciously sleep on a bed. On the run, moving here and there while learning sleep overpowered me. This is how they live. This is how their lives were. And this is how meaningful it was. So what did he say to Imam Shafi? In Allah alqa ala qalbika nuran. That Allah has blessed you with a light. Fala tutfi'hu bil ma'asiyah. Don't extinguish it. If there's anything that weakens our memory, that destroys our memory, it is unfortunately our indulgence in sin. And that has just paralyzed our thinking, our mind, etc. So that was the, the fifth quality in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. Then the sixth one, we're moving on. Shafqatuhu ala dhu'afa. He had this kindness towards the weak and the feeble. And where do we learn this from? When he was in the jail and he was innocently incarcerated, and there were two people, I'll try and wrap up shortly just so that we can conclude the topic. There were two people who were accused for poisoning the food of the king. One being the wine bearer and one who used to present uh, the food. And they both were under the accusation that they had poison and the case was under investigation. In that interim, while Yusuf salam was in the jail, he befriended them, he spoke kind to them, he spoke loving. Ya sahibay sijni a'arbabum mutafarriqoon khayrun amillahu al-wahidu al-qahar. Ya sahibay sijni amma ahadukuma fayasqi rabbahu khamra. وَأَمَّا الْآخَرُ فَيُصْلَبُ فَتَأْكُلُ الطَّ... Oh, oh, companions, oh, inmates of the jail. And he spoke to them lovingly and caringly. The ulama say, if you analyze the historical final sermon of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned their kindness to women and he spoke about the slave. الْوُقُوفِ بِجَانِبِ الضَّعِيفِ الْوُقُوفِ when he spoke about woman and he spoke about the slave, in essence, he was highlighting, recognizing the rights of the weak. Let me share with you something. I gave a talk at, at, at some, uh, uh, you know, social get together. They were distributing some funds. So they asked me to give a talk in the marketing world. So about three weeks ago, I was in London and this is where this dawned upon me because we had a personal interaction and I landed and the next day I had to give a talk and I, I shared it and I just have a flash of it now. So I'll share it with you. In the marketing world, in the corporate environment, 
if you want to boost your sales, you bring a big name on board. You bring a high flyer. You bring a prominent name. You inject strength into your company. Oh no, you know who's got shares in there. You know who's marketing for him. You know who's his billboard. So and so. So you inject in. In the deen of Allah, in the teachings of Islam, if you want to inject growth in your deen, employ a weak person, an unemployable person, a frail person, a person who doesn't have any strength or anything. So we in London, three weeks ago, we visited a charity organization and the CEO there is narrating to us, we have in lunch and a brother comes there and obviously from his demeanor you realize the man is challenged in his physical capacity. And, but a very friendly person, a very jolly person. I speak to him, etc. We have the meal and then I have a lecture. But the brother tells me, let me tell you a secret about this man after we moved on. He said, many a times in our communities, we have schools to educate these people who are slow learners, who are challenged learners, who have difficulties, who have disabilities. We school them through the career in whatever shape. But when they come out, very few people want to employ them. Because, I mean, you've you got to carry the man now. You know, he's, he's probably got one skill. He can maybe answer a phone. It's not so audible. It's a slur. And it just reminds me of another youngster who phones me and he cries to me. He cries. Allah is listening to me. He cries. He says, I have a disability, but I love you. I listen to your talks. Now, I grapple to understand his speech because of the intense slur and the disability. I'm not aware of the details, but over the phone, he just expresses a lot of muhabba. Then he sends me this message. He says, why is society discriminating against us? So does it mean I never get married? Does it mean I never settle down? Because any sister who has inclination, the parent is like, no, 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 how dare, how dare? And I comfort him and, and it moves on and on. And every time he phones me, I break down and I cry. And I say, Yalla, what do I say to this man? You comfort him and you give him, he's, he's, a, he's a human, he has feelings, he's a person, he, he's, he has any aspiration that you and I would have. He, he surely has his certain challenges. But unfortunately, we, we discriminate deliberately or inadvertently. So he said this boy was roaming the streets after he completed his degree and whatever little bit in his simple basic school and nobody would employ him. His parents were stressed. So I said, let me bring him in the office. He said, by Allah, the day I brought him in the office, like Halima Saadiya says, the day I picked up Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my life changed forever. The day this boy walked into my office, my office, my income, my, my revenue boomed like it never happened before. So to the world, bring a high flyer. To the teachings of Islam, وَهَلْ تُرْزَقُونَ إِلَّا بِذُعَفَائِكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ said, you don't sustain the weak amongst you. Their presence attracts sustenance for you. Their presence and I'm seizing the opportunity, like I said it to the corporates the way I had given my talk when I came back from London. If you know there is someone in your area, neighborhood, who has a disability, bring him on board. Give him some employment. Let him, he says his parents are over the moon because he earns a salary and he spends a day. He's in a good environment and, and he's doing... He says, the work he does, whatever he does. But Barka that I have seen, I've never seen. This is telling me one on one fresh incident. So this is the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is how Islam is. Islam, the world defines strength if you can drop your opponent. And Nabi alayhi salam defines strength if you can control your anger. That's the definition. That's the definition. So, shafaqatuhu ala dhu'afa. We move on. The next amazing quality in the life of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam was al-afu ma'al qudra to forgive despite having the ability to take full revenge. When is you forgive when you don't have the muscle, you don't have the clout, you don't have the strength, but you have the full authority to take revenge at optimum level. Never mind taking revenge you say to your servants, You see those youngsters that walk in, you take the money from them, give them the grain. Before they leave, you return the money to their saddle bags. Don't say to them, I'm telling you, that's my brothers. I cannot exploit them in their crisis. And you know how he forgave? May Allah give me strength to forgive. May Allah give you strength. My brother, this world is a test. The concluding verses of the 18 Jews, 
وجعلنا بعضكم لبعض فتنة. We have made one human a test for the other. In the footnotes of Tafsir Uthmani under this ayah, it's so amazing what's written. Allah, he, Allah Mashabir Ahmad Uthmani expounding on this ayah saying that we've made one human a test. O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we've made the disbelievers to test your sabr and we've sent you to test their submission. So you, you arbitrating in this marriage and they sit down and then you say like, okay, speak, uh, brother. No, 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 I don't have an issue. My wife brought me, let her speak. No, no, you are must uh, all know it all, so you speak. Okay, okay, please, brothers, can one of you decide? No, no, he always has a big mouth, tell him to speak. No, sister, you speak. Okay, so either one of them speak. The sabr I made with this man or this woman, nobody else can make. Okay, so if you make in sabr, that means you are the recipient and you are the victim and the victor is the other person. But ironically, the very person who by your definition is inflicting and is the victor, his words and turnaround is the sabr he made with you is unprecedented. So only Allah knows who made sabr. And what does the Quran say? Just look at the verse. Just, just I read this and I cry and I marvel because we're going through so many things. For my children, I'm a test because I'm imposing values on them. For me, my child is a test because he's testing my limits. He's pushing my boundaries. He's going beyond the limit. Listen, I need you back by nine, by ten. No, no, we start in the night. He's young. It's only happening now. It's chilling. It's relaxed. We were friends. Take it easy. What's the panic all about? So it carries on. The Quran says, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ fitna." We've made one a test to the other. أَتَصْبِرُونَ أَتَصْبِرُونَ Are you people going to persevere? وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا And your Lord is watching who's inflicting and who's receiving. You know, you go through so many emotions, you're like, does anybody know what I'm going? Allah says, I'm watching, I'm watching. وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بَصِيرًا Your Allah is watching and He knows. So Yusuf salam forgave in such a way, my brother, when, when Allah gathered the entire family and things changed and finally on the, on the, on the throne. So he, you know, scholars have written in great depth, he said that uh, all praise belongs to Allah. This is the dream I had seen many years ago that we would be sitting together and sun and moon prostrating to me and 11 stars, etc. Just, just, just look at the words of a Nabi. Just look at the words of a Nabi. Rabbi Haqqa. My Allah made it a reality. If you tell someone, mashallah, Allah accepted your dua. But you know what I went through? You know after how long? Huh? Dua is accepted. I'm not saying no. But do, do you, 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 you know, it's easy to say dua is accepted. Right? These are the kind of things we throw out. So we lose it there. He went through 80 years, footnotes of Jalalain, Hassan Basri, 40 years in each issue. My Allah made it a reality. And honestly, And Allah has been so kind when Allah liberated me from the jail. He didn't speak about the point when he was incarcerated because that gives a little bit of a negative reflection of consequences. But he highlighted the liberation. And the scholars say he, he highlighted the liberation from the jail and he didn't highlight the freedom from the well. But that was also an independence and a freedom because the well was a contentious topic. It, it would bounce back at the hostility of his brothers. So he didn't want to reference the well in any capacity so he doesn't give a hint to the wrong of his brothers. Like really? You know, some people, what, what they say in English, 10% of our conflicts are because of difference of opinion and 90% is because of our body language. You see the way, you, you, you seen how he was flashing his chest. You seen his eyes. What was he trying to say? Huh? You seen the way he was, you know, making his first, what was he trying to say? Our body language, our aggression, the way we throw out. And then he, when we do a wrong, we sweep it under the carpet. He swept his brothers wrong under the carpet. Where's that teachings? He said, Allah's been so kind, Allah took me out of the jail. And 
And Allah brought you here to the city because they were living there, coming to Egypt where things are found, everything, etc. After the devil had separated us. Not after my brothers were jealous and they were angry and they had this agenda against me. After the ulama say he used the reference of the devil and he watered down the mistake of his brothers. That is a Nabi, that is a Nabi. And I, I can only marvel and cry and say, Ya Allah, where are we from this mark? Where are we from this mark? And I'm running so quickly through it. And then the next quality that was found in the life of Yusuf alayhi salatu was ikramul ashira. Ikramul ashira. Caring for the family. So you grow, you expand, you develop. But then there's a moral obligation. So now he's sitting on the throne and everything is going good for him. And I ask is I must get it and if I don't get it nobody must get it what's happening no there's nothing there. there's nothing there no no don't go there no because I couldn't get it so I don't want anybody else to get it I I only want myself to get it that that is human nature that is human nature either I get it and if I don't get it I don't want anybody else to get the hint imagine Sayyidina Abu Bakr goes to propose to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for Fatima radiallahu anha and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is just modest and he doesn't say anything and he comes back and said Abu Bakr I tried but I didn't get a reply. Maybe it's meant for you. You go, O oh Umar. Allahu Akbar. And so Umar radiallahu goes and Nabi Sallallahu is silent and no reply. And then Abu Bakr and Umar both go to Abdurrahman ibn Auf that we tried, but it wasn't meant for us. Maybe Abdurrahman ibn Auf, this honor is decreed for you. You wedding the greatest daughter of Nabi alayhi salam, the queen of Jannah, Budhatum minni, a flesh of me. Man adaha faqad adhani. You hurt my Fatima, you hurt me. You please my Fatima, you please me. So they go to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. He tries. No luck. Then they go to Sayyidina Ali. Oh Ali, you try. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu goes to propose and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ali, I've been waiting for you. Right? And Sayyidina Umar said, there are three things. I'm green with envy for Umar. And one was Tazawujuhu Fatima. Allah gave me a lot, but Ali, the honor of marrying Fatima, this is something I will respect you and honor you and, 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 and be envious of you that Allah gave it to you. So Ikramul Ashira, the family, when he comes to Egypt and Allah blesses him with everything, and then what does he say? Wa'atuni bi ahlikum ajma'een. Listen, now you, your entire family, parents, uncles, aunts, siblings, go tell them they have a nephew in Egypt. Your uncle in the furniture business. We're not promoting anyone here. Go and tell them. Because that, 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 that is how life is. You know, when you're an unknown entity, then even your relatives don't know you. And suddenly when Allah gives you fame, then everybody's connected to you. Everybody knows you and they're related to you. You unheard of things, how it happens, they're all family members. That is, that's how what the English says, where there's a will, there's a way. And the other one is where there's a will, there's relatives. Because you're distributing an estate, so people are coming up. Wa'atuni, go bring the entire family, go bring the entire family. And Qurtubi has written something very amazing. He said he actually wanted his father to come. But his disrespect to say, tell my father to come. But then his position of being anchored on the throne and managing the affairs didn't allow him to leave. So he used a general phrase which encompassed everyone, including his father. So may Allah give us that selfless nature where we can reach out to all. Last two things in the life to wrap up the 10 thing. The other thing that was found in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam was al-fasaha. He was articulate. You know, I was telling my wife, we were go went for a program the other day and we, we flew and uh, I came back and then I flew and I came back and we were standing at the airport and probably I identify with this. It's appalling to see how Muslim and non-Muslim, professional, corporate, skillful individuals standing in a queue waiting but using vulgar language. Like you stand in and you're waiting to check in and then you use this vulgarity and then, okay, and it's like a very aristocratic and a very measured person and a high flyer and just vulgar, vulgar, obscene language. It's like, you know what, a, it actually gives you a shiver in your back. We've lost the whole thing. People just, I mean, they swear like a sailor. That is the, 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 the saying that goes, he swears like a sailor. But for some people, it's just, just casual and vulgarity just comes out and out. And that was never in the words of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, amazing in the tafsir, the ulama write, Allah is telling Nabi ﷺ, follow the revelation that Allah gave to you. And turn away from the polytheists. 
And then Allah switches from an individual expression to a plural expression. وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Don't verbally abuse the deities of other people because then they will insult Allah and you won't like it. So that's the balance of Islam. Don't go say, you know what, your idol is like this or your God is like this. The ulama say we differentiate between intellectual, intellectual engagement and a debate, healthy, proving, explaining, but not using condescending, nasty, derogatory. That is not. But look at what the scholars of tafsir say. Allah is using a... Single phrase, ittabi O Muhammad Sallallahu you follow, a'rid, you ignore. Then when it comes to don't abuse, don't use vulgarity, Allah says plural, all of you don't use vulgar. Allah doesn't address his Nabi because he never used vulgar. Wala tasubbu, that is to every one of us and not to Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Nabi of Allah never. So articulate, Why? what does the Quran say? This is an amazing thing. Falamma kallamahu, so Yusuf comes out of the jail and then the king speaks to him and he says this is what's going to happen. As soon as Yusuf speaks, his articulate nature, his command of the language, the manner in which he comes across, they are blown away, they mesmerize, they settle the whole thing. And they say from today you will be very honorable and respectable. I was in Sydney for a program, so I arrive at border control. The immigration officer starts questioning me, asking me questions back and forward. It's going on half an hour. I'm towing the line, answering. After a little while, he tells me, sir, I'm very impressed with your English. So I told him, yeah, and I'm impressed with your accent. So he says, yeah, thank you. And that just brings a chuckle and it just relaxes the whole mood. It just relaxes. I said, you know what, it's half an hour. Probably you want to get me a chair, please, man. No, no, that's fine. And then obviously the interrogation continues and protocol has it. But one of the teachings... Uh, Ibrahim Rahimahullah says, no, Muhammad ibn Hassan Za'farani says, Kana min ahli al-Arab. There was a nation from amongst the Arabs. Uh, ila majlis shafi'i. They used to come to the gathering of Imam Shafi'i. Wa and they would sit in a corner, but they wouldn't engage in the discussion. Faqultu li I said to their leaders, you people come to the gathering of Imam Shafi'i and you don't learn from him. Why do you come and sit here? They said, نَأْتِي حَتَّى نَسْمَعْ لُغَةَ الشَّافِعِ We only come to listen to Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah to learn from his choice of words. One person listened to Hindi songs, he said, no, I'm learning Urdu. I said, brother, 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 relax, man, you know what? There's a lot of ways of learning Urdu, man. Don't come and thrill me, man. Don't come and thrill me, man. نَسْمَعْ لُغَةَ الشَّافِعِ Oh, I mentioned this and then I won't even mention the other point. Just tell you this and then call it a day, inshallah. You know, Mawlana has been calling me for like five years. Allah reward him and keep him strong and healthy and accept his khidmat here. Uh, I remember him from the days in Madrasa, gentle, soft, passive, the same demeanor. Allah keep his khidmat going and inshallah that we continue to benefit from him. And this year when he sent me that message, I just didn't have a heart to say no. Not that I had the time, but his kindness and his passion, Allah made the opening and the niche and Allah made it possible for me to accede to his request. In Nafhatul Arab, there is a story talking of eloquence, learning. We need to improve. We need to teach our children language. We need to teach them speech. We need to teach them communication skills. That was amazing. When Yusuf spoke, So Hajjaj had issued a decree it issued a decree that man tafa laylatan ba'da al-'isha anybody who's roaming the streets after isha he will meet his fate and his life will be ended because you know in the night you retire to bed so the people patrolling wajada thalathata subyanin yatamayalun alayhim athar al-shurb there were three youngsters walking around and they were you know what semi drunk and you could see from the way they were walking that they were not all sober so the security, the person patrolling at night summoned him, took all three of them and uh, asked them, uh, what's your, what's, what's your you know, profile and who are you? So he said, you know who I am? The first one, he said, Anabnu mandanati riqabu lahu, lima baina makhdumiha wa khadimiha. 
I am that person before whom the king and the subject they drop their heads before my father. Ta'tihi wa hiya saghira. And they come to my father humiliated, humbled. He rotates them, moves them as he wants. Ya'akhudhu min maliha wa damiha. Then he draws their blood in quantity he wants and he takes money as he dictates. So the person patrolling, he said, La'allahu min aqaribi amiril mu'mineen. Okay, okay, you go. Never mind, don't do it again. Probably this is one of the royal family members here. I'm touching the wrong youngster here. You know what I mean? You press in the button of the wrong youngster, then you find out who his father is and they say, okay, go. Call the other one, you, what you doing here? He say, Anabnu alladhi la tanzilu al-arda qidruhu wa in nazalat yawman fasawfa ta'udu taran nasa afwajan ila dhu'i narihi fa minhum qiyamun hawlaha wa qu'udu I'm the son of a man whose pot is always on the oven, always on the stove and it's never down. If it barely gets down, it's up again. You would see people in their droves assemble around my father, drawing from his heat and drawing from his food. So I said, La'allahu min ashraf al-Arab. Looks like by this father, his father is very generous. He's very, very, by, okay, okay, you now go, but don't do this again now. He called the third one, he said, by you in a problem, what's your story? Anabnu alladhi khada sufufa bi azmihi wa qawwamaha bis sayfi hatta istaqamati rikabahu la tanfakku rijlahu minhuma idha al-khaylu fi yawm al-karihati wallati I'm that person who penetrates the rose and straightens it with his swords. His feet are never off his saddle and off his horse. He gets right into the depth of the battle when others turn their back. So he said, Bayh la'allahu min ashja'il arab. I think this is probably one of the strongest youngsters ever. You go. I don't want to interfere. But the next morning he said, Hajjaj, this is what had happened. You told me to patrol. I found three people. I summoned them. Each one of them gave me a very great profile. He summoned them up. He said, bring them. Say, what's your story? He said, yeah, I'm that person. People come and bow before my father and they drop their heads and he can take their money and everything. And then he takes their blood also. So, okay, what is your father? He said, no, he does cupping. <laughs> my father does cupping. الْأَوَّلُ ibnu hajjamin. My father does cupping. Call the other one there. أَنَبْنُ الَّذِي لَا تَنْزِلُ الْأَرْضَ قِدْرُهُ وَإِن نَزَلَتْ يَوْمًا فَسَوْفَ تَعُودُ that uh, his pot is on top and people come. Anabnu Qawwalin. His father was a singer. So people used to come for the concerts. He used to come for the concert and he used to feed people. So he gave up the notion he was a very wealthy, very generous person. So he said, okay, leave him. Third person, what's your story? Anabnu alladhi khada sufufa bi azmihi. I penetrate the better. I penetrate the rose with my sword. So Anabnu Haik, his father used to weave and knit. And he had this mesh machine, now you play with the pedals. Now this word pedals is the same thing like you put it when you sit on the horse. So his feet are never off the pedals. You remember the old days when they do and then they weave in, and then they do it. So when he said, I penetrate the rose, meaning when I weave with my needle, which he referred to as a sword, I make it straight, I make the rose straight. When Hajjaj heard this, he started laughing. He said, Wallah, allimu awladakum al-fasaha. Fa wallahi lawla al-fasaha ladarabtu a'naqahum. Teach your children skill. Teach them articulate nature. Teach them comprehensive speech. It is this gift of the gab and the choice of the words and the amazing articulate nature that rescued these people. Otherwise, perhaps they would, a chapter would have been closed. The last one, I'll mention it and we won't go into the detail that was amazing in the life of Yusuf alayhi salam was husnut tadbir. Good planning. A believer has a plan. We don't have a succession plan. We don't have a plan A. We have no plan in place. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا عقلك التدبير There is no act of intelligence better than good planning. When Yusuf ﷺ told them that seven years of drought and then seven years of prosperity, now how do you do? I read a book where a person wrote a thesis on an Islamic economy based on the advice of Yusuf ﷺ. That the seven years of prosperity don't mean you eat and party and indulge and then after that everyone dies. When you harvest your crop, you leave it in the ear so that you protect it against bacteria and worms and germs and you extend its life. Today you put it in a freezer and you, a freezer and you extend its life. An animal in captivity, its life is long compared to the wild. But at that time, with limited resources, he said, when you harvest, you leave it there. That was the good planning. That is how calculated he was. A believer has a plan. We need to think. We need to have reliance on Allah. But reliance on Allah doesn't mean we don't have a plan. 
The Prophet ﷺ is in the cave. The enemy comes to the mouth of the cave. He nudges Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, relax. Ma dhannuka ya Abu Bakrin bi ithnayn Allahu thalithuhuma. You don't have to worry of those two, the third of whom is Allah. Having said that Allah is with us, he didn't come out of the cave. Allah is with us, so go out. No, 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 no. He stayed in the cave. A believer has a good plan. Today, unfortunately, we sit on our chairs and probably the boss stick is too much there. So we wouldn't separate, we wouldn't relinquish, we wouldn't pass on, we wouldn't transmit the reins, we wouldn't have a succession plan, we have no planning in place, hence the chaos in the world. Wallahi, that is the beauty of the Quran and what I told you was just a synopsis. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill, infuse and imbibe within us these great amazing attributes and salient features of these Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam. And we, may we be amongst those people who learn knowledge for the aim of benefit. Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, من تعلم العلم ليعمل به ازداد علمه ومن تعلم لغير العمل ازداد فخره وتكبره واحتقاره للعامة. If you learn to practice after every gathering, your wisdom will increase. And if you learn for reasons otherwise, after every gathering, your arrogance will increase. Allah protect us. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من كل شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله